Hi, this is Pastor Randy Shannon. I'm so glad you joined me for today's message. Simon, do you see this woman? It's part of our Jesus and the Outsiders, Outcasts, and the Outlaws series as we go through the Gospel of Luke together in this Lent season. Our scriptures for today are from Luke chapter 7 and Luke chapter 8, starting first of all in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 39. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume, and she stood behind him at his feet weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears, and then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. And then from Luke chapter 8, we read verses 1 to 3. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, the wife of Chuzza, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. May the Lord bless us as we read his word. Well, we began a new sermon series last time that looks at the life of Christ as it was portrayed in the gospel according to Luke. Luke's gospel, we said, focuses on lifting up the lowly, on the manner in which Jesus especially sought out and attracted those who were overlooked or oppressed by society, the outsiders and the outcasts. Today, on the Sunday after International Women's Day was observed around the world, we will look at the impact Jesus had on the women of the first century. Last Sunday night at our Bible study group, I mentioned how weird it seemed as I watched the first season of The Chosen, a new series on Jesus and the lives he transformed, to see Mary Magdalene walking along with the disciples as they traveled with Jesus. Why did that seem weird? Because women were often silenced, not only in public gatherings in the first century, but also in the biblical accounts we have of that time. Adam Hamilton, in his book on the Gospel of Luke, which inspired this series, tells about the time his church gave his daughter a Bible when she was in third grade. After a few days of reading in Genesis, she asked him one day, Daddy, why don't the girls have names? It's a phenomenon that was rooted in the way that women were treated in the first century. They were important only in so far as their lives affected men. They may be named as the wife or mother of someone, but many of them would not be named at all. You might recall that when we talked about James, the brother of Jesus, that the Bible mentions the names of all the brothers of Jesus, but doesn't name a single one of his sisters. It simply says in Matthew 13, and aren't all his sisters with us? There are 1,700 unique people mentioned by name in the Bible, and of those, 1,563 are men, and only 137 are women. For every woman who was mentioned by name in the Bible, there are 11 men. We should not like this. Uh, we should not let this silence be interpreted to mean that women were not important to the mission or the ministry of Christ. But take it for what it is: a reflection of the status of women in the ancient world. The first century Jewish historian Josephus wrote that women should not be allowed to testify in court. He did not believe they were credible witnesses. A common prayer of first century men was, Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who has not made me a woman. Some rabbis in Jesus' time believed that women should not be taught the Torah because they might misuse it or twist it for evil. Of course, it wasn't only the Jews who viewed women this way. It was true nearly everywhere in the ancient world. But Luke's gospel, more than any other, shows how Jesus valued and included women as partners in ministry. Just consider again the words of Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, the wife of Chuzza, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. 
And these women were helping to support them out of their own means. Mary Magdalene was the theme of our lesson at Bible study last Sunday, and I mentioned that I would love to have read that story about her meeting with Jesus and how he had freed her of the seven demons. At almost every mention of her name in the Gospels, they make reference to that deliverance, but no one ever describes how it happened. And I wondered why. Was it because she was a woman? I don't know. But just consider how important she is and the other women were to the ministry of Jesus. Many of them are never named, but simply described as many others. But not only did they travel with Jesus, but they financed the ministry out of their own pockets. And Mary Magdalene, Luke in all the Gospels tells us, was there at the cross when almost all the disciples had fled in fear. She was there at the tomb as Joseph and Nicodemus laid his body to rest. And she was the first one there on Easter morning to see the empty tomb and be greeted by the resurrected Lord. And then she was the first one to proclaim that resurrection to others. You can't overstate the important role that women played in Jesus' cause. And as you read through the Gospel of Luke, you will find story after story of women who Jesus healed and ministered with. He healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law, for example. He responded to a grieving mother and brought her son back to life. He healed the 12-year-old daughter of the leader of the local synagogue, And he stopped to minister to a woman who had suffered from hemorrhaging for 12 years. Luke chapter 8 tells that story. Because of her bleeding, this woman had been considered unclean for 12 years. Talk about being an outsider and an outcast. She heard Jesus was passing by, and she pushed through the crowd to touch the hem of his garment. And when she did, her bleeding stopped immediately. And right there in the middle of the crowd, Jesus stopped and said, Who touched me? She must have feared that he was going to scold her. She didn't answer. The disciples thought it was a silly question. Master, they said, the people are crowding and pressing you. But Jesus persisted. Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. And trembling, she fell at his feet and told why she had touched him and how she had been healed. She probably felt that she was going to be disciplined or yelled at, but Jesus only wanted to know who did it so that he could see her. And bless her. Daughter, he said, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Time after time, Luke tells of Jesus' encounters with women. It seems like Luke wants to be sure that we know how Jesus valued and ministered to them. It's important for us to remember this because even today, women are treated as less than by our society and even churches. We've come a long way in the United States since women first received the right to vote in 1919, a right, by the way, that they had to fight 50 years to get. But even now, government statistics show that women make 80 to 84 percent of what men make who are doing the exact same job. And in the U.S., one out of every six women each year experiences an attempted or completed sexual assault. 81 percent said they have been sexually harassed at some time in their lives. 81%. Many women are still treated as if their only purpose is to attract the male gaze. And sadly, even the church is not without blame because 17.5% of women experience sexual harassment even in the church. Even in the 21st century, the role of women in the church continues to be debated Paul's personal advice to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, verse 12, that he did not permit women to teach or have authority over a man, but that that women should keep silent, has been applied to women 20 centuries later who feel called to teach Bible classes or preach. Just this past month, a large denomination kicked out one of their most prominent churches because they had ordained a woman to preach. The Cumberland Presbyterian Church was the first denomination in the Presbyterian and Reformed tradition to ordain a woman for ministry. Louisa Woolsey was ordained in 1889, and by comparison, by the way, it took until the 1950s for the United Methodist Church, for example, to ordain their first woman. But Louisa Woolsey was ordained by the Cumberlands in 1889. But even we are not always the best example of how to treat women. One of my dear friends from seminary went through a heartbreaking experience not too long before her ordination. As is often the case, she was asked as a candidate for ministry to preach at the service 
held during the meeting of their presbytery. The host church, however, said that their entire session would resign if a woman was allowed to preach in their church. I couldn't help but feel heartbroken for my friend. She was the brightest and most dedicated servant of Christ in our class. And I wonder, what would Jesus do? Well, we might get a glimpse of what Jesus would do in the familiar story of Mary and Martha found in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. You probably recall the story, but you might have missed one of the points it makes. To refresh your memory, Jesus and his disciples were invited to dine at the home of his dear friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus in the town of Bethany. Martha was busy fixing the meal while Mary sat at the feet of Jesus and listened to his teachings. Martha got irritated and asked Jesus to make Mary come help her prepare for the meal. But Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. One thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the better part. It won't be taken away from her. Now we need to realize that Martha was not the bad guy in the story. Martha's doing exactly what she was supposed to be doing according to first century thinking. She had invited guests and she was doing the work of providing for their needs. What she was doing is what would have normally been expected of her. Remember that the rabbis at that time believed that women should not be taught the Torah, the law of Moses. Mary was being a rebel. It was somewhat radical for a woman to be sitting at the feet of the teacher like any other disciple and listening to his teachings. She was violating the gender roles of the day, and Jesus commended her for it. Jesus broke down the societal barriers by inviting women to join the male disciples as they sat at his feet. There are at least ten stories in the Gospel of Luke that happen at a meal, like the story of Mary and Martha, Seven of those stories are found only in the Gospel of Luke. So let's look at one more story before we close today. Today's text tells the story of a Pharisee named Simon who invited Jesus to dine at his home. The Pharisees were a sect of Jews that consisted of about 6,000 people who were known for studying and teaching the law of Moses. The name Pharisee literally means separated, and that's how they lived. They would have, have nothing to do with sin or sinful people. We mentioned their attitudes towards the Amha Arez last week, the common people of the land. They had utter contempt for those who didn't live up to their standards. While Jesus befriended sinners, the Pharisees separated themselves from them. Simon must have been curious about Jesus' notoriety and invited him to his home, but it was not apparently to show him respect, but possibly it was intended to put him in his place. Simon did not give Jesus any of the customary hospitality treatments common for that day. He did not greet him with a kiss on the cheek or provide a basin of water to wash his feet or give him any scented oil to freshen up. But Jesus didn't protest the slight. He simply took off his shoes and curled up next to the low table with the other guests. But then a woman crashed the dinner party. Luke says, a woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. We don't know what her sin was. She might have been guilty of stealing, addiction, or adultery. We don't know. The fact that readers have traditionally assumed that she was a prostitute may say more about us than it does about her. In any case, this sinful woman had apparently heard Jesus speak at some time prior to this, and his words must have made a huge impact. She felt conviction of sin, but more than that, she had felt the hope of forgiveness and redemption. And Luke continues, as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair and she kissed them and poured perfume on them. In this simple act, she did all the things to honor Jesus that Simon had failed to do. But Simon did not see her brokenness or the potential for her redemption. He saw her sin. And Luke notes that when this Pharisee who had invited him saw this woman, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus tells Simon a parable about a lender who had two debtors and forgave both of them their debts. He asked which one of the debtors would love him more, and Simon answered, I suppose the one who had the largest debt canceled. That's right, Jesus said. And then he said, Simon, do you see this woman? 
It's a great question. Not do you see this sinner, but this woman, this broken, hurting, ashamed woman, this woman who needs grace, not judgment. Do you see this woman? Adam Hamilton asked, what do you see when you look at others? Do you see their sins or their humanity and their heart? Do you find yourself judging them or having compassion on them? Do you look down on them for the clothes they wear, the words they speak, the sins they've committed, the life or lifestyle they lead? Or do you see them as dearly loved children of God? I have been Simon the Pharisee, he says. I've often told my congregation that I am a recovering Pharisee who sometimes falls off the wagon. I confess that I am too. Aren't we all? But Jesus saw this woman. Not what she had done, but who she was to God and who she could be. And he sees you. He sees your pain, your brokenness, your hurts and heartaches. He sees who you were meant to be, a dearly loved child of God. And he says to you, if you ask him, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Last week I said that Jesus has continued his ministry of lifting up the lowly through us, the body of Christ. But to do that, we must see them. We have to really see the outsiders and outcasts and even the outlaws as people beloved by God. Not for who they are or what they've done, but for who they can be in Christ. We have to see not through eyes of judgment, but eyes of mercy, of hope, of love. Let's ask for that kind of vision. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, open our eyes that we might see others as you see them, that we might love others as you love them. May your Holy Spirit transform us and shine that transforming hope and grace to all we meet so that as we lift Christ up, all people will be drawn to him. For it is in his name and for your glory that we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining me for today's message. I hope to have you join me again next week. Until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to smile and shine upon you and give you grace and peace for every need. Amen.